Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. History made presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has chosen California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. Harris is the first black and Asian American woman to ever be nominated as a running mate on a major party's presidential ticket. We'll have much more on this historic announcement coming up. But first, it is the big story of the day. A wild chase through Bear County ending with two people in custody. Sky 12 capturing the driver zooming through interstates and residential streets. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke with neighbors on the south side where it all came to an end. We had noticed that the helicopters are flying overhead. What Albert Villarreal saw was a car chase that lasted about an hour. Informed my fiance because she has that KSAT app. Say, hey, there's something going on. So. Uh, she said, yes, there is, and before we knew it, we turned on TV and followed, followed the scene. This all started just before 2.30 this afternoon. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says deputies tried to make a traffic stop on Highway 16 and Twin Valley near the Atascosa County line. They say the driver in the gray Acura cut off another car, nearly crashing into it. That's when the chase began. Deputy Garcia says the driver traveled northbound on Highway 16, rear-ending an 18-wheeler. He says a female passenger bailed out but was caught by Somerset police. The pursuit continued onto uh, Highway 16 to Loop 410, 410 to 37, 37 all the way up to I-35. Garcia says the driver collided with a patrol unit and even rammed into a gate, causing property damage of up to $30,000. At one point, the sheriff's office canceled the pursuit due to heavy traffic conditions, and DPS stepped in. Ultimately, the suspect bailed out of his rapidly failing car and made a run for it in the 1300 block of of West Hutchins. Residents in the area watching this all unfold. He had a right front uh, front tire already blown. Uh, tires, you know, was uh, gone. I mean, it was just pieces. He just kept running. Troopers moved in and took him down. BCSO says the man was found with an ounce of methamphetamine. Villarreal is thankful no one in his neighborhood was injured. Luckily, at this time of the day, it was you know pretty hot, so all the kids were inside. The 27-year-old man is facing several felony charges, including evading arrest. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It is unclear tonight if the female passenger is facing any charges. A five-year-old boy is dead from complications of child abuse. Tonight, his father, who was already convicted in a 2015 child abuse case involving that boy, is facing a new charge, capital murder. Kirby police say in 2015, Rex Holland said he shook his then six-month-old son and slammed him down in a swing because he wouldn't stop crying. The night team's Patty Santos spoke to the lead investigator about the case. In 2019, 38-year-old Rex Hollins was sentenced to three years in prison for hurting his son, and he was just released on probation last month. Well, the arrest comes now simply because Zane passed away. Kirby police say Zane Hollins, now five years old, was never a normal child after the abuse at the hands of his father, Rex Hollins. The child was, for the lack of a better term, total care. Um, the child's uh, condition was grave, to be, to say the least, uh, required almost total care. In December 2015, doctors told police Sane suffered bleeding in the brain, a broken rib, and broken leg. In June of this year, investigators were called to Sane's home on Jink Street in Kirby, where he was found dead. The medical examiner's office says the five-year-old died of complications of remote blunt force head injuries and classified it as a homicide. Those injuries were at the hands of of his father and his father was thus convicted and charged with injury of a child, we can tie it all together that he's responsible for, for his death. It's the first capital murder case in recent memory for the city of Kirby. But police say child abuse happens every day, everywhere, and families need to be vigilant. All I can tell his parents is, you know, ask for help, seek it. It's hard to be responsible to raise another human life. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. In 2019, there were more than 5,300 confirmed child abuse cases in Bear County alone. That number is expected to increase this year because of the pandemic. To report child abuse, call 1-800-252-5400. Other top stories we're following tonight. San Antonio police tell us a man had to undergo surgery but is stable after being shot by a woman at a home just west of downtown. That shooting happening in the 4,000 block of Acorn Ridge Way near Ashbury Oaks. 
Officers on the scene tell us a man had been shot at least once in the leg. The woman taken into custody. Their relationship is unclear. Two children were also home at the time and witnesses to the shooting, but they were unharmed. Police say they've been called to the address before on multiple occasions. It's unclear why that investigation is ongoing. Still no word on charges in the death of a 17 year old who was killed at a Super 8 motel in Universal City. The teen has been identified as Steven Vasquez Flores. Police responded to the 200 block of Palisades Drive around 430 this morning. That's near 1604 and Pat Booker Road. Officers say Vasquez Flores had been fatally shot on the first floor. It's unclear by who or why. At last check, four people were in custody two of them minors. Meanwhile, it's been a month and police are still searching for a driver who hit and killed a man near the south side. It happened back on July 11th. According to police, 21 year old Antonio Lopez was crossing the street near South Flores and Division Avenue when he was struck. Officers say the driver took off. Lopez died at the scene. Investigators believe the suspect's vehicle is a sedan with dark tinted windows. Information that leads to an arrest could be worth up to $5,000 from Crime Stoppers. The number to call 210-224-STOP. Turning to coronavirus and the latest here in Bear County, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg announcing 205 new cases of COVID-19 today, bringing us to 43,164 since the beginning of the pandemic. Another 11 deaths brings our total to 519. Meanwhile, 720 Bear County residents are currently in the hospital with 317 in the ICU and 216 on ventilators. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention releasing new guidance on face masks for K through 12 schools. The CDC says masks could cause unintended consequences. For example, a child could experience bullying, discrimination or st be stigmatized if they do or don't wear a face mask. Also, some parents might not agree with mask policies. The CDC says districts should have a plan in place to handle both of those challenges. Teachers and students aren't the only ones preparing for this new change this new school year. School nurses are also trying to adapt. The night team's Jaffney Gray with how Northeast ISD nurses are prepared to handle the coronavirus on school campuses. You know, there is so much more on their plates. There is so much more at stake. And I think that our nurses are certainly up to the task. As school reopens, Northeast Independent School District made sure to provide their school nurses hours of COVID-19 training. That training includes contact tracing they've learned through Johns Hopkins University. They will be able to know how to trace where they've been, what questions to ask, and then hopefully make sure that it doesn't spread. All 90 of their nurses have also been tasked with creating an isolation room. The district also has an electronic form that teachers must fill out when they see one of their students showing symptoms of COVID-19 while on campus. Before they come, they will alert the nurse's office that someone with possible COVID symptoms is coming in so that they have time real quick to isolate everyone, make sure the clinic is cleared, make sure they have on all of the PPE. The district says this controlled approach will help prevent them from going down the same path this Georgia high school did. That school has since been shut down for cleaning purposes after several students tested positive for the virus. We don't want to open just a close again and then reopen. So we really need to be smart. We need to learn from that experience and we are looking, you know, at how other schools who have already reopened, how they are um, handling the situations and, and the safety plans and reopening procedures that they have been putting out. Most districts in Bear County are doing a phased approach to bringing students back for in-person learning. Couldn't do this without all of our nurses and they they really are the backbone of our department. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Turning to ongoing bar closures across the state, Governor Abbott providing an update today as to when they might reopen. Although COVID-19 hospitalizations are on a downward trend statewide, the percentage of positive COVID-19 tests is at nearly 21%, the highest it has been in months. Abbott says he wants that positivity rate well below 10% for a significant amount of time before even considering the reopening of bars. 
and when they do, people would still need to wear masks and remain seated at their assigned table. We're getting a better idea of how much it will cost to recover from the coronavirus pandemic here in San Antonio and how the city will pay for it. In a budget presentation today, city staff told council members they expect to spend $492 million on coronavirus related expenses over the next three years. That money covering everything from testing costs to the city's emergency housing assistance program. Most of that money is coming from grants. More than 94 million of it will come out of the city's general fund. Happening tomorrow, KSAT along with our community partner, University Health System, joining forces to demonstrate just how hot it can get inside a vehicle during the summer months. All day long tomorrow, there will be a van parked here at our station. We're going to be checking the temperature periodically in an effort to bring awareness to the dangers of leaving a child or a pet inside. There's been some days that we've seen a discrepancy that it's 165 degrees inside the vehicle and 100 outside. Jennifer Northway from University Health will also be here. We're going to be talking to her throughout the day across all of our newscasts so you can see just how quickly the temperature can change throughout a South Texas day. And just a reminder, the next episode of KSAT Explains premieres this Thursday, August 13th. This week's episode is all about the facts and science of climate change. What does the future climate of Texas look like? Why is it something you should care about? And how did this issue become so polarizing? KSAT Explains Climate Change will be available on demand on Thursday on the KSAT TV app, which is available on Roku, Fire Stick, and most other streaming devices. It's still to come on the night beat. Biden picks Harris. So look back at the road which brought them together, plus reaction to today's historic announcement from President Trump and former President Obama. They don't agree. And later highlights from today's KSAT Town Hall event, all about learning during a pandemic. Our panel addresses some of the tough choices ahead for students, parents, and educators. Tomorrow is the first day of school for Bernie ISD, where the majority of parents have decided to send their students back for in-person learning. I'm Sarah Costa. Coming up tomorrow on GMSA, we give you a preview of that first day. Joe Biden has chosen California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. Yeah, it's a move that fulfills the wish of some Democrats clamoring to see a woman of color on a major party's presidential ticket for the first time in U.S. history. ABC's Alex Prichet has more from Washington. Biden-Harris, rivals now running mates. After weeks of speculation, Joe Biden informing Senator Kamala Harris over video chat of his historic decision, calling her a fearless fighter for the little guy and one of the country's finest public servants. Harris responding in a tweet, I'm honored to join him as our party's nominee and do what it takes to make him our commander in chief. Senator Harris, a former district attorney in San Francisco and California's attorney general. If elected, she would be the first woman, black woman and Asian American vice president. The daughter of immigrants, her dad from Jamaica, her mother from India. Ultimately, Joe Biden has said he was looking for someone he could trust. The thing choosing the vice president is whether or not the person is simpatico with me in terms of where I want to take the country. During the 2020 campaign, Harris notably attacked Biden on the debate stage. You know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools, and she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. Harris dropped out before the first votes were cast. Last month, photographers captured handwritten notes of Biden's before a press conference. Under Kamala Harris, it read, Do not hold grudges. Campaign with me and Jill. Talented. Great help to the campaign. And great respect for her. President Obama tonight writing, Joe Biden nailed this decision by choosing Senator Kamala Harris as America's next vice president. He's underscored his own judgment and character. President Trump already on the attack. Plus, she was very, very nasty to one of the reasons that surprised me, she was very, she was probably nastier than even Pocahontas to Joe Biden. What's interesting is the president twice donated to Harris as a private citizen when she was a candidate for California Attorney General in 2011 and 2013 for a total of $6,000. Now, Harris and Biden will appear tomorrow in Wilmington, Delaware. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. 
back up to the century point. 101 we're thinking in San Antonio and probably about 103, 104 when you get over toward Del Rio, Camado, and Eagle Pass area along the Rio Grande. Locally, 101 New Braunfels, Leon Springs will be about 97 tomorrow afternoon. So very similar heat right around the century mark, even Lake Hills and Rio Medina, about 100. Now tomorrow, because of the heat and the added stress on our power grid, it is another CPS Energy peak demand day. So they suggest reducing your usage between 3 and 7 p.m. Something easy? You want to get out of doing laundry? Don't do it between 3 and 7 p.m. I just gave you an excuse. You got to save energy. Now, today was one, and we saved an estimated 189.4 megawatts, enough to power about 37,000 homes. All right, here's a look at our satellite and radar, and really a clear sky overhead. There's one thing this weather pattern is good for, and that's viewing the Perseid meteor shower. That's right, it's not too late, even tonight. It's going to peak tonight and early tomorrow morning. Now, the best viewing is from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Obviously, not all of us will be up at that time. So if you head outside soon, look off to the northeast and pretty low in the horizon. And if you're away from city lights and you let your eyes adjust and you're patient, you could see up to about 30 meteors per hour. That's in an ideal situation. Most of us won't be seeing that many. If you want to go out during peak viewing, 2 to 4 a.m., basically just look straight up, let your eyes adjust and You'll see a few uh, shooting stars or meteors out there. The Percy, it's from the Comet Swift Tuttle. All right, here's a look at our upper level wind flow. I mentioned the upper level high was over Texas again, centered over West Texas. We'll notice Monday, this gets pushed westward. That's good for us. The farther we can remove ourselves from that upper high, the better it is for us in terms of trimming back temperatures and at least giving us the opportunity to kickstart some showers. And so we could see some isolated rain showers in the forecast again by the early part of next week and we'll chip off a few degrees from the high. Tropical Depression 11 now out in the Atlantic Ocean. This is way out there. Pretty weak system right now, likely to gradually strengthen and become Josephine over the next couple of days as it tracks westward. I mean, by Sunday, it could be near or just north of Puerto Rico. All right, so tomorrow morning, 79 here in town, 101 the high temperature, a lot of sunshine throughout the day, a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Staying at or slightly above 100 the rest of the week through the weekend. And there's that pattern shift I talked about where we could see those temperatures get trimmed back a bit into the upper 90s by Monday and Tuesday. At least a shift in the pattern, so, some change out there. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, Greg, help me understand this. They're, they're playing eight games in the bubble. That's true. The Spurs could go six and two. They could. And not make the playoffs. And still need help from either Memphis, in this case Portland, or Phoenix. I mean, there are four teams right now that are kind of on the bubble in the bubble, if you will. When we come back, more about the Spurs' big win. In fact, they've been nothing short of amazing inside the NBA bubble. And at the same time, the Big 12 decision is in. If somebody had told you a month ago that you guys would have a chance to go six and two in the bubble with this group of guys, with the injuries that you guys have and make the playoffs, how much of a reality was this outcome for you guys coming in with the focus of development? I would have had them drug tested. <laughs> Yet here they are in big board sports. <laughs> Rocket star James Harden sitting this one out against the Spurs today. He does not like what he sees. Houston up by five early, but not for long. DeMar DeRozan, the drive, the spin in the lane, the left-handed finish to give the Spurs their first lead of the game. Keldon Johnson grabs a Drew Eubanks miss and goes up strong. That was San Antonio after a six-point lead. Lonnie Walker had ten big points in the second quarter. First is three for the wing, and then lead grows to 19. A minute later, Walker driving the lane, takes the contact, gets to the fall. The Spurs are up by 21. Spurs got contributions from everyone. Seven players in double figures this afternoon. Marco Bell Nelly for three of his 13 right there. Then Rudy Gay, by the way, in the final seconds of the third, drains a three. He also had 13. The Spurs were up by 20 going to the four. The wild Mustang, as Pop likes to call Keldon, had a career game going baseline for the bucket and the foul, then knocking down his third three of the game. He finished with career best 24 points, 11 boards, and the 123 to 105 route of the Rockets to keep their postseason hopes alive. He's a high energy guy. Uh, very physical, uh, very competitive, very coachable, 
uh, he's he's just a winner. Oh, he's a horse. He he continues to work hard offensively and defensively. Um, you know, he's always attacking the rim. Um, he's a lot bigger than a lot of people think he is. So um, it, it's great to see everything turn out the way that it should for him. All right, Spurs still have to win tomorrow against Utah. We'll see what happens with the other three teams. Today is Patty Mills' birthday as he turns 32. Pop revealing before the game that he helped him celebrate by getting his family on video chat during the team meeting. At the same time, he explained why he shut down the Australian for the most part inside the NBA bubble. He knew what we were going to do as far as just helping him, having him help us mentor the young kids and uh, let them get the minutes. Um, you know, he, we know what Patty is and how important he is and uh, didn't really want him to go out there and take a chance on getting hurt for next season. You go. As expected, the Big Ten has become the first Power Five conference to announce that they are postponing the fall football season with the hopes of playing in the spring. The Pac-12 follows shortly thereafter with the same action. The announcement comes after several days of speculations and reports amid the health concerns revolving around the coronavirus. And it comes despite the pleas of players, coaches, even the president of the United States to let them play. It also comes after as many as five players in the Big Ten were diagnosed with a rare disease known as myocarditis, in which it's the enlargement of the heart muscle believed to be accelerated celebrated by COVID-19. When you look at this decision, uh, it just we just believe collectively there's too much uncertainty at this point in time uh, in, in our country and to, to really to encourage our student athletes to participate in fall sports. The big question is, would the Big 12 follow the Big 10 and the Pac-12 in postponing fall sports this spring? In effect, canceling the 2020 season. University presidents meeting virtually starting at 5 today. Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby. And then following that, a meeting, university presidents meeting with their own athletic directors trying to decide which course of action to take. According to at least two reports, the Big 12 is going to continue to try and play. They made it to state last year. Now the Wimberley Texans want to win that championship next. Our big game previews take us to Wimberley, where the Texans are ranked in the top five at number four in Class 4A Division II in the state, according to Texas Football Magazine. That's after the Texans made it all the way to the state finals, where they lost to Texarkana Pleasant Grove 35-21, finishing 12-4 overall. Head coach Doug Warren welcomes back 14 starters to the team with six on offense, eight on defense, including running back Moses Ray, who rushed for over 1,200 yards, scoring 15 touchdowns, and wide receiver slash defensive back Christian Marshall had over 1,300 yards receiving and 18 touchdowns to go along with his five interceptions on defense third class to get to state that was big for us getting that far it was unbelievable and i would do anything to get back to it this year you have to use that as a springboard and uh you know we had a lot of success last year like i said played in the state finals came up a little bit short there so there's some extra motivation you know, but it is a different team. We've had some key losses and, and just trying to find some young guys that are going to fill into those spots and, and uh, you know, carve out their, their uh, legacy. The Texans will kick out their season at home against Canyon Lake on Friday, August the 28th at 7.30 p.m. And just think, the kickoff of the high school football season between 1A to 4A will actually be two weeks from this Thursday. Wow. Pretty close. Right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. Following the co collapse of relief negotiations, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin offering a timeline for when Americans could see new unemployment benefits announced by President Trump. But what's still unclear is where all that money is coming from. We'll have the latest coming up. And plus, we're going to take a look back at tonight's KSAT Town Hall event, highlighting some of the issues that many of us are facing when it comes to learning during a pandemic. It's after the break. The coronavirus pandemic has caused uncertainty and lingering questions about how or when students and teachers can safely return to classrooms. That's why we held our learning during a pandemic town hall event this evening. Yeah, our guest panel included, among others, two local superintendents, as well as a student, some teachers, both on the city's community response task force, as well as a state representative and a UTSA researcher. Let's take a look back now at just a few of the bits of this conversation. Students, educators, teachers, parents, we need to be in these conversations. We are going to be the people affected. Don't make decisions for us, make decisions with us.
My main top concern is just the safety of my students and the safety of myself as a teacher and the safety of my family. Because I'm not only a teacher, you know, 12 hours a day, I go home and I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, you know, and I don't want to kill my family. And thanks to Monica for sharing her thoughts with us on this very important topic. We're continuing our town hall here. We have often talked about how schools are a safe haven for a lot of kids. Uh, Melina, I want to pose this next question to you as the teacher on our panelist. So often teachers play the critically important role of recognizing when there are problems at home with a student and perhaps, you know, reporting that, making sure the, the child gets help. You talked about how teachers wear so many different hats. How can teachers continue to fill that gap and to recognize when a student uh, may need extra help, may be in harm's way when we're doing remote learning? Yeah, I know that's been something that's come up um, so often. I, I will say, you know, I mean, we do run into those issues, um, but we also um, see the majority of our families are really invested in um, seeing that their children are productive and that they are working and they're doing the best that they possibly can to ensure that they're they're being successful through virtual learning. So, yes, I mean, we certainly are reaching out. I know that um, myself and um, all of the teachers that I know, we spent hours from March through June and in and, and, and the day, hours in the day, communicating with our families, calling them, um, doing Zoom lessons, um, speaking to our students, not just about lessons, but I mean, you know, touching base with them and building those relationships that we always do with them. But I know that I talk to families consistently to ensure that the students are being um, successful and to hear out whatever issues or problems they have. That's what teachers do. They are going to continue to do what is best for kids and, um, you know, that's we we want to ensure that our students are successful. So we will do everything in our power to ensure that. Alejo, I don't know. Alejo Sosa, I, I, I don't know if you heard the conversation. Uh, it was a, a young woman from the Young Women's Leadership uh, Academy talking about her frustration that students concerns are not being brought into this conversation. You have a voice perhaps bigger than any other students uh, in town. Are you feeling that? frustration from some of your fellow students um definitely and and i do i i know uh the student that that just spoke you know uh, we're both a part of the siisd student coalition and one thing that we've constantly been driving forward is um nothing for the students without the students right and i think um constantly there are only one or two um student representatives in um, spaces like these um and we just need to work more to incorporate more students right you know mr martinez asked what can we do to support those students reach out to those students you know get them engaged in the conversation and really um strive to to improve their situations i think that for virtual learning that um all too often we're, we're really quick to look at it from a deficit mindset when we can look at it um in a positive light like mr burial uh, just mentioned right we we have the capacity to build a positive virtual learning experience for students and i think that all too often school districts abandon these ideas and want to revert back to in-person learning when some of these students, right, the majority of these students can't afford to get sick. Their families can't afford for that. And I think that just when we reach out to students, we see that these problems are recognized and, and our coalition has seen that in our work. Let's talk about a, a big topic I think every teacher, parent, student wants to address. What happens if? Yeah. Uh, Superintendent Martinez, I will pose that question to you. What happens if a teacher or student tests positive for COVID-19. So what we're doing even now is is just working directly with Metro Health. And so we follow every one of their, every step of their procedure. So we do contact tracing. We inform any employee that was in contact with that individual. We have them quarantine themselves. What we've done in our district for our staff, because I've gotten this concern so much, is that uh, we're, we're gonna make sure that if staff have to be on leave, that uh, they, won't be, they will not be charged any sick time, so that everybody will have whatever time they need to be quarantined to get better. Uh, we're actually right now uh, trying to get an insurance policy for our students, uh, because so many of our students are in extracurriculars and UIL activities, and I really would like to have a policy that even protects our children for COVID-type uh, related expenses, because, the, you know, we know even though the numbers are small for children that, that can be hospitalized, but they can be hospitalized. Uh, parents can be hospitalized. Grandparents can be hospitalized. And so those are the things that 
unfortunately, our state don't have the uh, proper safety nets. Uh, you know, we have a large percentage of our families that don't have insurance. It's something that our board is very concerned about. So, again, these are things that we're exploring right now to try to see what we can have in place, again, so that when, we, when children do come in person, when it is safe, hopefully we can have these safety measures and uh, hopefully these resources for our families. And, and, of course, our staff will have those resources uh, of not having any, any sick days being charged and, of course, being part of our medical program. Are you concerned about the possibility that you may open and then have to close? I mean, do you have a, a protocol in place like when it's time to shut down a particular campus again and what that could do to the learning process? So it's one of the reasons why we're being so meticulous in how we are going to uh, open up schools. In other words, uh, you know, having, you know, a voluntary set of teachers come in on the first day that it would be our, our safety committee not allowing students to come in person for instruction until again we have our safety procedures in place all of our equipment being very gradual about it like i said at the most four to six children i'm empowering teachers and principals to make those decisions with parents uh, so it might be a child coming in one day a week and then when we feel that that's working well or the child needs more help two days a week and we keep moving on uh, and then for families who want to stay remote they will have that option and and i'm going to def definitely take a little uh, uh, you know the suggestion you made really you know engaging in students as well as parents of how do we make that remote learning plan successful so that so that families uh, can you know families who choose that option whether it's the whole semester or the whole year that we know that there's no academic loss because again what, what uh, dr Virel, uh, related in terms of the survey results is a real concern for many of my colleagues that we don't want children to be losing academically uh, because they're trying to be safe and that's you know that's not that's not a fair choice for families to have to make right. we need to be able to do both that was just a small piece of the much larger conversation we had with our panel this evening if you want to watch our learning during a pandemic town hall in its entirety you can still do so right now on ksat.com we'll be right back Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather streaming free on KSAT TV. It's been one of the big stories of the day. The fact that Russia is claiming they have a vaccine to fight COVID-19. But there are a lot of people that have their doubts. ABC's Alex Frische has more. Tonight, the rest of the world's reacting to Russia's claims of having pre-regulatory approval of a coronavirus vaccine. However, Russian scientists haven't reported testing the drug in the critical phase three trial on humans. The World Health Organization is now investigating. Pre-qualification of any vaccine includes the rigorous review and assessment of all required safety and efficacy data. The WHO encouraged that several potential vaccines are developing quickly. However, many are skeptical of Russia's claims of a proven COVID cure. The point is not to be first with a vaccine. The point is to have a vaccine that is safe and effective. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar says the U.S. is still expecting to have a vaccine in the next few months, perhaps even by December. December is also how far out the president is extending new $400 weekly unemployment benefits. His plan requires states to cover $100 while the federal government will contribute $300 on each check, something many governors say they can't afford. In a bipartisan statement, the National Governors Association writing, We appreciate the White House's proposals. However, we are concerned about the significant administrative burdens and costs this latest action would place on states. The best way forward is for Congress and the administration to get back to the negotiating table and come up with a work solution. Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer saying this about the president's plan. It is so put together with spit and glue that in all likelihood many states won't implement it at all and many more even if they want to implement it will take months, several months while people will not get their unemployment benefits. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin countering. Within the next week or two, most of the states will be able to execute. Meanwhile, Dr. Anthony Fauci saying in order for the U.S. to get this outbreak under control, it must get below 10,000 cases by the fall. As we get into the winter and fall, with the likelihood that we'd have a convergence of two respiratory diseases, we could have a very difficult time. Fauci again saying the key to that is following CDC guidelines, wearing masks and social distancing. Alex Prashay, ABC News, Washington.
The coronavirus has created unique challenges for special needs parents who have depended on school systems to provide treatment and education for their children. Just explaining the virus and its impact on daily routines is complicated, especially for the one in 54 children in the U.S. diagnosed with autism. Ursula Perry with ways parents of children with special needs can talk to their kids about the pandemic. What do you do with your hands? Wash your hands. You wash your hands. Raquel Regalado is the mother of two autistic children, including 16-year-old Bella. She says when the pandemic first hit, it was tough. There was a lot of anxiety, you know, uh, and a lot of questions. Raquel went back to basics, creating a new routine for her kids. What do you have to wear when you go outside to take a walk? Hat. Your hat. I think the most important thing is that they tell the truth in their, in a way that they are going to understand. Parents of children with disabilities need to be honest when it comes to the coronavirus. There is a germ, there is a virus out there that it's dangerous to our health and we have to protect ourselves. Giving kids with special needs a visual can help explain concepts like social distancing. Maybe draw a square that is six feet um, big and tell them this is your space, your personal space. Camilla says it's important to try and stick to a daily schedule. Raquel plans her activities at least a week in advance to make sure that she has all of the supplies to keep her children busy. If you're having problems struggling trying to find activities for special needs children during these coronavirus times, you can always go to www.thechildrenstrust.org. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, take a look at this video from Beirut. The people there paused protesting today to mark exactly one week since the devastating explosion at a port warehouse. There, I think they actually stopped the video on that one. Residents held a vigil to mourn the more than 160 people killed and the tremendous destruction wrought on their city. Improperly stored chemicals are thought to be the cause of the blast. The Lebanese government resigned on Monday as a result of public anger at corruption and negligence that likely played a role in that explosion. Meantime, let's take another live look outside with live cam on this. What are we today? Tuesday. I'm losing it track. Is it's Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday evening where we're at uh, 89 degrees, Adam. That means you're having a good week. There you we know? go. It's like you lose, lose track. track of yeah, time. It's like I, I, on... I think it's happening a lot during this pandemic. Yes. I'm just going to be honest. I don't think Very we're alone <laughs> no. in that. Especially yeah. with kids. They, I've noticed the yes. kids. Wait, what? What day is it again? It. It, to them, it, they all just end in Y. That's all they know right now <laughs> through the pandemic. So the aquifer, it is down today. I want to point that out. I actually took a pretty big hit. It's down 1.1 feet, now to 656.7, and we're 1.2 feet below the August average. Still stage one water and restrictions. We have a little ways to go before stage two would be implemented. Mold, the only allergen, and it is on the low end. So we're looking for rain showers. Obviously, we could use the rain and... Today, we had a few offshore and one little shower made its way onto the coastline and that was about it. Parts of far west Texas had a few hit or miss showers. It is monsoon season in the desert southwest, so you, they start to see that activity out there. Even around Tucson, you see that actually the upper level high pulls in Pacific moisture that helps feed some of those desert showers and thunderstorms this time of year. Nice dip in the upper level flow, Oklahoma into Arkansas. That was a good rain producer for them too far removed for us all because of the upper level high. Now this will be shifting westward in the coming days and that's very important, especially when it gets over Nevada. That's where it's going to be as we get into the early part of next week. So they're going to see their temperature spike here in the western third of the country from basically California, Arizona, all the way up to about Calgary in Canada. And this upper level high is going to be further away from us. That's going to open the door to this northerly flow and any little disturbances that could be embedded within it that could kickstart some showers and storms. Also, the farther we get away from that, usually the more we can trim back on temperatures a bit. So I do see a bit of a pattern shift by early next week. That'll give us that 20% chance. So maybe a few isolated showers into the picture by Monday and Tuesday. Right now we're 86 degrees, a clear sky. You can still see the Perseids out there. Take some time. Let your eyes adjust and get away from any lights, even a driveway light, a street light. You want to get away from it all. Look low on the northeastern horizon right now. It peaks tonight, especially from 2 to 4 a.m. 
You'll feel the humidity out there. Dew points into the 70s. We're feeling that mugginess and air temperatures right now for the most part in the 80s, but still 90 degrees farther west of town. So tomorrow morning, 79 degrees with some clouds to start the day. Otherwise, another very sunny day. As we said at five today, just a few ornamental clouds. That's about it. 101 for the high temperature and a southeasterly breeze at five to 15. As my late grandfather would say, hotter than Annie Oakley's pistol out there. That was his line, but he was in St. Paul, Minnesota, so that was probably 85 degrees. Yeah, that's not, that, that's not 101 probably. <laughs> no, not yeah. for us, but I still like to say it when I can. And, and we'll be at that level, Grandpa Bob. That's where we'll be this week. Did I mention my friend Marge thought, uh, is mm -hmm. suggesting we send somebody out to videotape the Perseids tonight? Oh, yeah. good and luck I, capturing I, that. I think it's great until I saw that it was like 2 and 4 a.m. I don't yeah. think we're going to have a lot of photographers Takers, yeah. that are going to. You need, you need good uh, good. Equipment as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm right. hoping somebody, maybe somebody will shoot some and mm -hmm. send it back to us. Thank you, Adam. Mm -hmm. Well, finding a used car for your teen at home can be a challenge for many parents. Up next, some advice for those searching for safety and reliability at a decent price. Safe cars for teenage drivers. If you're a parent looking for a good used car for your teen, you probably want the safest, most reliable, and most affordable one you can find. It's not an easy hunt, though. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with some picks to consider, and they're less than six grand. Teens behind the wheel, immaturity, inexperience, and all those distractions add up to risky business. Crash tests for teens are quadruple those of drivers 20 and up. So when choosing a car, parents want something that's safe, won't break down, and won't break the budget. When choosing a vehicle for a young driver, it can be a struggle to find one that gives them very good crash protection with one that can help them avoid the crash in the first place. To help families zero in, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and Consumer Reports joined forces and data. They considered how well a car handles in an emergency. Brakes on dry roads. Whether it has electronic stability control, on this screen the bottom one does not. And of course crash tests. From a 40 mile an hour front corner crash, to this T-bone right into the driver's side. Among the best of their 65 recommendations for teens, the Chevy Equinox, 2016 and newer, and the Honda Accord, 2013 and newer. Five of their recommendations are priced at less than $6,000. The Mazda 3, Honda Civic Sedan, Subaru Legacy, Lincoln MKZ, and Hyundai Tucson. Those model years range between 2011 and 2015. All of their cars have electronic stability control, above average reliability ratings, and are priced less than $20,000. The entire list is on KSET.com. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. In other consumer news, the coronavirus pandemic creating an unprecedented demand for disinfecting wipes. It's why Clorox is making more of them than ever before. USA Today quoted Clorox President Linda Rendell as saying the company is making nearly a million packages of wipes every day. She told ABC News Clorox has increased its manufacturing capacity for disinfecting products by 50%. Clorox has acknowledged there's a product shortage because of high demand. The company expects the shortage to last until next year. Well, if you ever lose your way and happen to have an Apple Watch but don't care for Apple Maps, you're in luck. Good Maps is returning. Google also announced it's rolling out an updated an update this week that will expand its Maps apps Maps apps compatibility with Apple's CarPlay system. The return of Google Maps to the Apple Watch comes three years after the search engine giant pulled the app. The new app includes step-by-step -step directions and estimated arrival times. It will be available to download in the coming weeks. My script said good app, but I think I meant, or good Google maps. apps. Google Maps, maps. yes. Maps apps, maps go. apps. <laughs> the, la the last Not standing, cool. I, I kid, I'm, I'm with you. The last standing <laughs> Blockbuster store has been converted temporarily into an Airbnb for a lucky few. We're throwing it back to the 90s next.
Remember Blockbuster? There's only one left. It's an independently owned store in Bend, Oregon, and it's teamed up with Airbnb for a new experience. For three nights only, people can book it for an overnight sleepover like none other, transporting you back to the 1990s. It's been temporarily converted into a makeshift living room with a pull-out couch, a 90s-era chunky big-screen TV, a VCR, yes, and 90s decor. You have all the store's videos at your disposal, and you also get free pizza, soda, popcorn, and candy. All for, get this, $4 a night. What? Yes. How just, do they make Yes. What? Just a cent more than the cost of a rental. The catch, though, you have to be a resident of the county. Ah, uh, okay. This. That would be funny. Such good memories. That bedspread is so Zach Morris. I yes, love it, it is. <laughs> be kind, rewind.